Legend of Total War here, and today we're doing another Top 5 Total War video. This time covering the Top 5 Legendary Lords in Total War Warhammer 2. So these are the Legendary Lords who on campaign, not just are good on the battlefield, but also good to have as the faction leader. So bonuses that they provide to the campaign, whether it be passive bonuses to their own army, or to the entirety of the faction, will all be taken into consideration as to decide who is the best Legendary Lord. With that being said, let's jump in now to number 5. Coming in at number 5 is Cetra the Imperishable, who's the faction leader for the Tomb Kings. Now, if you play on Legendary difficulty, you'll know that Public Order can be a massive pain. The minus 8 Public Order debuff to all of your provinces can really slow down your expansion. But Cetra has the potential to provide the most global bonuses to Public Order than any other Legendary Lord in this game. Just selecting him as your Legendary Lord will grant the faction effect of Imperishable, which will provide plus 2 Public Order to all your provinces, and an additional plus 10 growth, which is good, but that's not what we're focusing on here. Now that's not it. Once you start leveling him up, you'll eventually get Conquerors of the Past, which provide an additional plus 2 Public Order. And then eventually after that, once you've obtained his weapon, the Blessed Blade of Petra, he provides an additional plus three public order, you know, amongst other things that these these weapons and traits provide, providing a total of plus seven global bonuses to public order, which almost negates the pain in the ass minus eight public order debuff due to legendary difficulty. Now, if you're not playing on legendary difficulty, then maintaining public order just becomes super easy with him, which allows you to keep expanding at a rapid pace. You know, instead of having to sit back in your province and constantly smack back rebellions one after another, you can focus on expansion. And that's not the only reason he's on this list. He's also an amazing melee fighter. It does largely depend on what your what mount you want to put him on, whether it be the Kemrian War Sphinx or the Chariot of the Gods, will determine what he's particularly effective against. I personally prefer to put him on the Kemrian War Sphinx, but he's just as effective. Um, on the Chariot of the Gods. It just depends on what your personal preferences are. He's also a decent spellcaster, but due to there only being 39 points to distribute in a unmodded campaign, I usually don't put any points into his magic and just focus on his being an absolute beast in combat and being a good commander with his red and yellow skill tree, avoiding the, uh, the, uh, the spellcasting because you can always just attach a hero to do the spellcasting for you. And that's why... Cetra the Imperishable gets the uh, the number 5 spot. Let's now move on to the number 4 pick. Coming in at number 4 is Count Noctilus. So the main strength that uh, Noctilus has really boils down to Necrofex Colossus. His mount is the Necrofex Colossus and his faction and his own traits boost Necrofex Colossus. Now, Necrofex Colossus are probably the strongest unit in this game. If you spam them, as we've done in this instance here, it is probably the strongest army that you can build in this game. Obviously, it's very cheesy, but there is pretty much no army combination that can counter this, you know, in a, in a straight up 20 versus 20 army fight. Now, Noctilus's skills all boils down to boosting the Necrofex Colossus. So he gets a Necrofex Colossus himself, then getting access to the Wind of Death, but also uh, the overcasted uh, Invocation of Nehek, allowing you to heal these Necrofex Colossus over and over again, and reducing the upkeep cost for Necrofex Colossus, allowing you to just produce a hell of a lot of them. In addition to that, Noctilus is the only character of the Vampire Counts that is able to recruit a Necrofex Colossus in just one turn, potentially, due to his faction trait reducing the 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 time for recruiting the Necrofex Colossus by, by one. The base is three, but then also the technology, which every other um, with which every other legendary lord of the vampire counts can also get. So every other legendary lord takes two turns to recruit a Necrofex Colossus, but Noctilus only takes one. So it really just boils down to Noctilus being bloody unbeatable in battle. And if you're unbeatable in battle, it doesn't really matter so much if public order is a little bit troublesome. The Vampire Coast play is not really about 
rapid expansion. It's more about going around and smashing everyone and building pirate coves and expanding very, very slowly. That's how they play. And Noctilus is by far the strongest vampire account lord. Anyway, let's now move on to number three. Twilight is here. Coming in at number three is Alithana. So Alithana has got a bunch of different things that make him particularly strong. So if you select him as your legendary lord, you'll have two unique abilities uh, for your entire faction moving around the campaign map. Being able to ambush enemy armies when you're on the attack, which is a very Skaven thing to do, but also very helpful, especially if you're up against multiple armies. Another thing is being able to use the Shadow Realm pathways, allowing you to bypass mountains and those kind of things can really help you get around the campaign map a lot quicker, especially in mountainous areas, which he does start off in. Now, if you don't select him as a legendary lord and instead confederate with him later down the track as one of the other high elf legendary lords, you won't be able to utilize those abilities. But he's still a very powerful legendary lord. He himself in a duel, not particularly strong. He's one of the best archer lords in the game, but that's not what we're referring to here. What makes him truly powerful is his ability to boost his entire faction. Whether or not you select him as your initial legendary lord or not, putting 2 points into Renegade will give you plus 12% missile damage all armies faction wide. Now that does cause diplomatic relation penalties with the High Elves, but minus 8 is it's some, you just it's a nothing to be concerned about. It just doesn't matter. In addition to that, once you get to Shadow King, it provides plus 4 public order to all provinces. Now that's not quite as much as what Cetra provides, but Cetra doesn't provide plus 12% missile damage to all armies faction wide. And that's one of the reasons why Alithana gets the number 3 slot. He's a very powerful legendary lord, even if you're not particularly using him in battle. Anyway, let's now move on to the number 2 spot. My technocracy. Coming in at number 2 is the Skaven Legendary Lord, which was just introduced with the latest DLC, Ikit Claw. Now, I don't have a particularly high opinion of the Skaven, but Ikit Claw is on a league of his own. He's probably one of the most overpowered Legendary Lords in this game. His abilities are just beyond absurd. Now, he would have gotten the number 1 slot if basically he just wasn't Skaven. Now, the list of things that he does for his his faction is just insane. For one thing, he's the only Skaven Lord that's able to access nuclear weapons, which can turn an otherwise unwinnable battle into a winnable one. Uh, he's able to access the Forbidden Workshop, which is insanely powerful upgrades for some very powerful units. And then on top of that, he's got one of the best skill trees out of any Legendary Lord. So, just going through things, his item here, uh, the Storm Demon, provides plus two public order all provinces, which is good, it's not, it's not Cetra worthy, but it's still pretty good. In addition to that, if you play your cards right, you can get Warp Lightning to cost only two magic and have one second cooldown. On top of that, if you select Second Wind Serum, he'll regenerate hit points every time he casts a spell, which if you're using this, it's constantly. So, he's just unbelievably powerful in a battle. Now, as the Skaven, you can end up racking up easily 150 wins of magic in a single battle to, to utilize. So, casting this spell 75 times can do a hell of a lot of damage. Uh, in addition to that, him on a Doom Wheel, once he's buffed up a lot of his strength, he's extremely resistant to combat. So, you can use him as a complete tank. He is... Just one of the best legendary lords in the game, and I've had a blast playing as Ikit Claw. He's, like I said, he's just unbelievably overpowered. You wouldn't think he is, just looking at him, but he is just such a tank in battle. He's a tank, and he dishes out so much damage, and just all of the bonuses that he provides to the faction itself makes him probably overpowered, and I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised if he were to get a nerf sometime soon. Anyway, let's now move on to the strongest legendary lord in Total War Warhammer. Alariel's champion. Coming in at number one is Tyrion. Now, Tyrion is the faction leader for the High Elves, and he is arguably the best melee lord in the game. There might be one or two characters in the entirety of the game that can actually take on Tyrion in a one-on-one -on -one fight and actually win. And any of those characters that can beat him on the in the battlefield 
will not be able to beat him in terms of campaign abilities. The thing about Tyrion is that he's not the best at any one thing, but when you add up all the little things that he does for his faction, it really adds up and gives a gigantic boost overall to the High Elves. So again, he's a great melee lord. There are very few that can actually handle him in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and he's an excellent tank which is a very important trait, especially if you're using a missile-focused army. So, he really does boost his, his army by a lot by just by, by soaking up so much damage. Now, he also has Sonfang, which provides plus three public order to all provinces, and Unifier, which provides an additional plus one public order, giving him a grand total of extra two. So, not as high as Cetra, but still pretty good. Again, he's not the best at everything, but when you add things up, it really it really adds up. Having a look at his stats, his stats are probably the highest out of any legendary lord, and this is without the Sword of Cain. Yes, he's at level 40, he's maxed out here, but those stats are still amazing. Now, if you go down this chain here, that's probably the way to go in my opinion, but you could always go down the Bloodline of Anarian, which would make him even stronger in melee, but has, has drawbacks with it as well. So, since these two here are mutually exclusive, far better to go down Majesty of Ulthwine. Now, there's also sense of, sense of urgency here, which, if you're playing on legendary difficulty, there is always a sense of urgency. Having the ability to recruit using global recruitment much faster because of him, and that's regardless of whether you picked him as your legendary lord or whether you confederated with him, reducing the time to recruit and increasing the amount you can recruit per turn is a big bonus, especially if you're in a dangerous situation. And that's what it really comes down to as well. A legendary lord, that's great when things are going well, that's one thing. But having a legendary lord that can really pull you out of the shit when things go badly, that's another thing entirely. So when you play as Tyrion and you've got these skills, losing a campaign is virtually impossible. And then over here, he reduces the upkeep cost by 10% for all units faction wipe to all armies, which is not crucial, but it really does help, especially on legendary difficulty. Hence why in this particular campaign, which is more or less over, uh, we're making so much money, although there's various other factors that make shitloads of money for the High Elves. So when it comes down to it, Tyrion just provides lots of little bonuses that really boost the faction. He's not the best at any one thing, but he's one of the most versatile legendary lords in the game, and that's why he's getting the number one pick. Any time that I've played a campaign not playing as the High Elves, Lothurn pretty much always takes the number one spot when in the balance of power until I actually have to go and tank them down, which is quite difficult most of the time because Tyrion's such a beast. Anyway, that's my list. What do you think? Which Legendary Lords do you think should have been on this list? And which Legendary Lords do you think didn't deserve to be on this list? Let me know in the comments below, and we'll see you next time, fuckers.